Welcome everybody. My name is David Graves. I, I work here. I'm a lecturer. And uh, so a little bit about the department. Before that, just a little bit of uh, health and safety. The, if the fire bell goes, then we need to leave and exit the building through the front gate, the front back door. We hang around out there until somebody gives us permission to go back in. And the lavatories you probably already discovered, uh, with some on the floor above here, and there's some at the far end uh, on the ground floor, which is what we call the street. The building is divided into this part, which is supposedly the public part, but these doors are actually locked at the weekend, uh, including the front uh, gates, front sliding glass doors. So my phone number is there, and hopefully I won't lose my enter card, but I have my mobile phone with me, so if people are arriving while the doors are locked, give that ring, that number a ring, and I'll come down and let you in best we can do for the weekend. Uh, we're in, normally this building is buzzing part of the weekends. Um, so yes, yeah, so welcome to the computer laboratory. Uh, this is um, the Faculty of Computer Science in the University of Cambridge and this we are in the William Gates building. Bill and Melinda uh, paid for half of this building provided other people matched it, which fortunately they did. And um, we moved here from central Cambridge in 2001. Uh, we have uh, 47 academic staff, like myself, 31 sport staff, and 69 affiliated research students, like RAs and so on. And then we have students. Uh, we have uh, a lot of PhD students, 114 currently. Uh, so you can do the ratio of 114 to 47. Uh, so on average, we've got just over two each. Uh, the 49 postgraduates reading a master's and part three which is an advanced computer science uh, option for those who have already, already read computer science. And then we have undergraduates, we have roughly 50 per year at the moment, sometimes it's more than that. We have 100 in the first year because we um, mix up with other subjects and people who have been in computing science along with something else. Uh, perhaps our most famous invention was the EDSAC computer, uh, which was ran its first program not in this building, not in the previous building, but in the building before that, in the centre of Cambridge, uh, in 1949, printed out a table of primes. Uh, and uh, we are still designing computers today, as uh, Jonathan will tell you about one shortly. Uh, we've had uh, five heads of department, I think, or six in fact, one briefly, but uh, Wilkes designed the um, EDSEC, and, uh, uh, saw its construction, his name is above the glass door, and we came in, and Roger Needham, who brought us, who then became head of Microsoft Cambridge, and we had Microsoft out the back uh, until two months ago when they moved down to the station. Uh, Robin Milner, very famous computer scientist, his citation list is um, off the top of anybody else's, um, and his process calculus work. And Ian Leslie, who sits in the next office to me, um, and uh, I won't say much about him, sorry if you're listening to him. Uh, <laughs> and our current head of the department um, is uh, Andy Hopper, uh, who was founder of um, several, many global companies in fact. He was currently the president of the IET uh, for um, another month, I think it is, and he was also my PhD student, my PhD supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> I was his student. Uh, and in terms of what we do here, we don't do everything in computer science, far from it. We do core theory and hardware, and we do certain application areas. Um, some other application areas are done in the engineering department, for instance, for instance speech recognition. Uh, but here's a, a brief list um, of, of the main uh, topics. And um, programming languages, compilers, and computer architectures is one of the ones that um, most involved with. There's mostly theory, but then there's a few application areas, uh, graphics, AI, mostly theory and core systems, bioinformatics. This is me. I'm a senior university lecturer now. I am chairman of the degree, so I actually tell the lecturers what to do. Uh, and my research interests are uh, hardware compilers, compiling high-level representations uh, into uh, hardware gates. Recently I've written a compiler for a language called BlueSpec, and I'm writing a new back-end for that at the moment, which will produce error 
tolerant, hardware platform, resilient uh, against circuits. Uh, I'm also interested in simulation modeling, which is what I'm going to be talking about in the first talk. Uh, and another area which I'm very interested in but haven't really achieved much in is automated reliable component composition, by which I mean we join up two things and we do automated proof about the composition. And the things we're joining up may be IP blocks being imported into a system on a chip, or they might be a pair of train carriages which are coupled in a station and we want to prove that pressing the button will open the exit doors all the way along or something like that. And that's all for that talk. So any questions I'm happy to take on the department or the local arrangements? Tea and coffee facilities? Yes, so tea and coffee, been a slight pick up, but Julius is sorting. Oh, I had a out. look, it's not that easy to make coffee en masse at the moment. The machine that we would use is out of order. So there's an espresso machine there that works very well, makes very good espresso, I just found out. So uh, there's water for tea. And there's also there's water for tea, there's yeah. milk. So there's a little kitchen there that we can use. And um, there's also two drinks machines. One is down at the far end of this building on the, on the public side of the street. And the second one is in the uh, rear of the building, the main part of the building, which uh, I can take a small posse of people to that drinks machine with my enter card. Put the coin in the slot, so um, it's not perfect. Right, maybe we'll get it better tomorrow. But it, during the tea break, maybe we can go in and use that room and yeah. do up some. I'll open that door in the tea break. Yeah. But don't, don't wander all over the building, please, because I won't get in trouble. <laughs> okay. But so uh, Jeremy asked me to talk about what I've been doing with Open Risk, which has been going on uh, for five or six years. Uh, the um, thing that I've been doing most recently is annotating an open risk core and a complete high level simulation of the system on a chip with um, not only the conventional timing uh, metrics so that we can work out how long a program is going to take to run on a multi core processor, but also get some idea of the uh, power consumption, uh, energy use. Uh, and so if we change our cache structure or change our DRAM um, structure, how much energy is it going to use? And doing that at a high level is something that industry needs to do because the conventional approach is virtually tape out and get layout information and then finally find out how much energy your system is going to use. So high level um, uh, color annotations. And um, so I've been doing this using uh, a library for System C. I'll tell you a little bit about System C in a second. Um, but uh, one of the things that we want to do is have a kit of parts that we can plug together easily to reconfigure the system and run off the shelf uh, ELF binaries uh, on a multi core system. We're not expecting total accuracy. Um, we're certainly going to be accurate to within an order of magnitude. Typically, we might be accurate within 20 or 30 percent. We might be getting better than that in the future. But um, the most important thing, really, from the architectural exploration point of view, is that the derivatives have the correct polarity. That if we change something, it gets better or worse, and it doesn't do the reverse of getting better or worse. So we actually find out something about the benefits of the changes that we take. So you're saying it's the power accuracy you're aiming at the point, power estimation? That's accuracy. right, power estimation, energy consumption estimation, is all that from high level simulations. System C level? Yes, from System C, high-level TLM. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, System C uh, and transactional modeling for those not familiar with it. Then I'll talk about our own add-on libraries for um, power annotation, and then a little bit about some of the experiments, which are still um, ongoing, and a little bit about x86-64 measurements. So um, I, I don't know how many of you actually are familiar with System C. If everyone is, then just stop with a couple of four slides to summarize System C uh, itself. So it was um, it's basically a free C++ library uh, for hardware description. Uh, and it's existed about 10 years now. Uh, it's, um, it's very simple. Every C++ object is uh, 
instance is a of a component, we can instantiate an object hierarchy much like we would instantiate an RTL logic hierarchy. Um, so it gives us, so C++ gives us most of what we need for objects and modules, um, but the system C adds on some naming conventions on top of that, give it everything an instance name. Then it adds a thrust package so that um, everything can uh, run parallel, uh, although the free versions of system C which are out there unfortunately don't work on multi-core, can't exploit multi-core simulation platforms today, so that, that's a very uh, significant weakness now for system C. Um, and the, the threading kernel uh, has the communicate commit signal paradigm, which we see in Verilog and VHDL, where, which is useful for modeling uh, zero delay flip-flops so that we can evaluate the whole of the next stage function and then atomically commit it on the clock edge. Uh, it also has a library of fixed precision integers so that, for instance, if we have a 5-bit register, it will overflow when we add 1 to 31. It has some plotting and logging facilities for generating output. Uh, and it's now had two transactional modeling libraries added on top of this um, basic hardware description system. So it was originally intended as an RTL replacement. It has very similar semantics to VHDL in fact. Uh, but increasingly and recently it's been used for high level modeling of system on chip um, using TLM modeling, which I'll tell you about. And also there are synthesis tools for it. Most of the major EDA vendors now have a synthesis solution where you can take system C, all of them have, and it's many startups, four or five startups also offering synthesis from system C actually two gates. So here's a simple example module. Um, this is a counter, there's no hierarchy here. Uh, we see um, that the C object is actually enshrined with a macro. Uh, this module is going to be called my counter. And then this is the net level input and outputs that we would expect to see in a very long VHDL description, clock and then reset, and um, a 10 bit wide value which in this case will overflow when it reaches 1023 as we'd expect. So all of the arithmetic and logic operators are overlaid to work with those. Then we have some behavior for this component, which is method, which is called uh, under some event conditions. So it's incrementing the, the value of the running sum if the enable holds. And because sum is one of these signal things which has to communicate commit paradigm, we actually have to suffix its uh, read method with that call. And the uh, write method is an open of the equal sign. And then here in the constructor for this module, we're going to tell us when to um, run this behavior. Um, so this is a macro which expands to my counter kernel on my counter. Uh, and it says we're going to have a method called M, and it's going to be sensitive to one of the signals block here on the positive edge. So that the method is going to be called in every positive edge. So for those of you familiar with Verilog VHDL, it should be nothing confusing there. And equally, we can have a, a structural netlist. Uh, so here we have two D-type flip-flops um, connected together to form another component. So this component is called shift reg, and it has its connections to the outside world defined as usual. Uh, it has a local um, internal net, which is um, this wire between the two flip-flops, and then here we have the structural instantiation of the um, uh, components wiring up the netlist in the netlist format. Now C doesn't have a reflection API, so the, unfortunately the system doesn't know about the names of these things by default. So in fact, if you want error messages to be a little bit more meaningful, you actually have to put in a little bit more, and put the net names in inverted commas in a few places as well. Um, and this is bog standard old fashioned uh, system C. Um, the interesting thing is that these uh, inputs and outputs and the local signals and so on, um, they're actually very generic wrappers. And rather than just passing a Boolean of um, a wire, uh, we can have a complete bus or a complete abstract data type and struct and pass a complete Ethernet packet on one, with one event, which will take us towards higher level modeling. And uh, moreover, we can actually do thread calls along the wires. And this will take us into transactional level modeling. So rather than this being a piece of wire, this structural connection between these components, 
carry one bit, we can actually use it as a means of calling a method on another software component, software modeling component. So that's called transactional double modeling, and that's what's illustrated um, on this slide here. Um, this is a typical net level view of uh, printer parallel port um, that's associated with protocol. If we look at it um, in the TLM notation, then we draw these little arrows with um, little arrow markers on the boxes, and uh, that denotes uh, the complete connection. So this connection here had uh, eight data wires, one control wire in that direction, and um, one acknowledgement signal in the other direction had handshaking and flow control. When we're going to be subroutine calling between these things, we're going to do higher level modeling by removing the uh, handshake wires and actually blocking the thread using a blocking subroutine call to uh, affect the flow control. And so there's two ways you can program that up. Um, you can have this to sender doing a subroutine call on the target or the other way around. We can have the sender doing a subroutine call on the target to try and They're both always initiated by a subroutine call on the um, target. In this diagram, the arrow goes in the other way while the data continues going in the same direction. It's just get versus put. Sorry, I didn't explain that too well. And in fact, actually, generally speaking, we have data moving in both directions in a transaction because the typical transactions that we want to do are an operation on a memory model or a cache, uh, and that operation could be a read or it could be a write. And the, the direction of data transfer will depend on some flag bits uh, in the transaction. Um, so that's um, basic transactional modeling, and then we also, to get timing information out of such a high-level model, we need to interact with the um, time system of system C. Now, the naive way of doing this um, is that, for instance, in this put by method, which is going to be invoked as part of a TLM call, we put a call, wait 250 nanoseconds. Um, and each call of this, this thread will suspend at that point, and the system C will run other threads uh, until 250 nanoseconds has gone by in the normal event-driven event -driven approach. Um, but this tends to be very poor in performance because we're entering the event-driven kernel very, very frequently, several times per transaction, especially if this transaction has gone through multiple bus switch elements to get from the initiator to find the target device. So the much more greatly preferred coding style is to use uh, the loose timing approach, which is instead we're going to have a variable of type time associated with each thread. And we're going to pass that by a reference uh, as the subroutine goes through the different parts of the system as the call passes along those wires. And instead of doing the wait, we're just going to locally add on some delay to that variable. So it will accumulate all the delay that this supposed to have had. And this will run ahead of time. Uh, and um, but at any point we can do this. Um, SC wait will just wait um, for that delay. Uh, that should be a lowercase d that something's corrected into uppercase. Um, and that um, we'll set the delay variable to zero for the thread and communicate uh, and pause this thread until everything else in the system has caught up. And so the effect of that is that uh, the, um, we, we enter the kernel much less frequently, we can do a lot more work before synchronizing with the rest of the system, but our transactions will start to get out of order uh, if we let this run up too much. And so at any point where we're actually waiting for something else to happen, we need to do one of these, otherwise it won't happen. Uh, it's not, there's no true concurrency in the system C, it's all voluntary before you enter the kernel. And there is um, uh, and we can overload our memory, memory fence barrier type instructions if we're clever to actually do this at the appropriate times. So that, that's um, just spent a few minutes on sort of background to this general high level modeling approach, which um, I hope is really useful. Um, so, what have I been doing? Um, started actually with a second year, third year student here doing this final year project, uh, put together a system of this nature. He took um, an instruction set simulator for a processor, and he wrapped it up 
as a system C module. And then we, over the years, we've written many more modules. And so we have modules which describe um, network on chip components, such as buses and caches, and memory systems of various types. So was the instruction set simulator pure C, just plain C? Uh, yeah, everything is, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all in C. Yeah, yeah. but I'm just, I, I'm just wondering if that motivated you to like system C as opposed to like system variable. Um, the reason for using system C versus system Verilog, well, transactional modeling didn't exist, system Verilog didn't really exist when we started this yeah, out. Okay. Now it might be worth revisiting. Uh, so so this, uh, this uh, processor has um, uh, an infinite while loop, it gets, a curve, it gets one of these threads out of the event driven kernel, and then it's able to make the execute instructions, and it's able to do uh, bus operations which are going to be reading or writing data generally. Um, in fact, you can be doing two of these in parallel the instruction fetch and the data fetch, as well as internal processing. So in some of our models, uh, this thread forks three ways inside here, and at the end of a, an out-of-order sequence or a basic block of instructions, um, what we want to do is we want to find out what was the slowest thing that happened in that basic block and do a max operation on the delay variables of the various components and then that's how long that basic block took. We then compare that with our target quantum, which is how far ahead of the, the main system time we want to run. And if it has um, reached that target or exceeded it, then we do await another part, other calls will then run. Otherwise, we can carry on with the next basic block. And also, any of the other parts of the system perfectly free to zero the delay variable and let other parts of the system run. Um, which is needed if there's real contention being modeled, then you've got to let one thing actually proceed, actually run before you can do your thing because you're blocked by it. So that's a general setup that we've used, and we've put various processes in here, including the open risk. Um, so now let's just talk about power modeling. So I've only talked about delays so far. For power modeling, uh, we started off with a, a library developed by the Atomic Energy Authority in France. Uh, called TLM Power 2, and um, in fact, TLM was a bit of a misnomer in what they did because it applied to any sort of model and it wasn't transactionally oriented at all. Instead, um, what they, they did was uh, had the concept of a standing power, in fact, two standing powers, static power and dynamic power. So every module times a static power consumption and a dynamic power consumption, these are added up separately on a per module basis, and then there's all sorts of facilities for aggregating these into reports. Um, and the, in order to um, change power, um, then you um, have to um, just call a method like update power, and then we'll move this component to a new power modeling mode or phase, so it's on and it's in um, compute phase. And then in the table for this sort of component was associated how much static and dynamic power is associated with that. And this works fine when we're doing this old-fashioned, naive waiting for 10 nanoseconds um, because real time is in sync with the, um, uh, with the actual components, but no good for this for time to get there. So we um, changed this. Uh, first of all, we had to add some more physical units. Um, TLM Power 2 already adds energy and power units, a complete system for modeling those on top of the basic time unit provided by system C. Um, but um, we then added on voltage, so we could support frequency and voltage scaling, and finally, length and area, so we could model physical layout and wiring length distances to get um, that sort of information out. So now we have a complete sort of physical modeling system in the library, and all the normal rules of physics and dimensional analysis apply. Multiply two lengths, you get an area, you divide an energy by a time, you get power. That's right. Um, and then we inherited the records, accounts, and observers technique of TLM2, um, which I won't go into the detail on, on this slide. But rather than using two accounts per component of subsystem, static and dynamic, we're actually normally using three. The third one is modeling the wiring uh, energy, which wiring energy is becoming a dominant component in chip design, as I'm sure you all know. 
uh, and we need to count the transitions of those number of bits on the wires to work out the energy dissipation uh, for those. So how is that distinct from dynamic energy? Are you, are you referring to just cell internal power consumption as dynamic energy? Yeah, so, so it is, so I think wiring energy is dynamic energy, good question. Uh, but the uh, dynamic energy under this heading is the internal energy for okay. the component, which would be the same regardless of how much wire it was connected to. Uh, and this is how we annotate the system C models with, with this sort of thing. Um, this uh, is a slightly more smaller font, a little more detail. Um, but basically, we're going to um, add on to the delay the time uh, used as before. And then this is the new bit. Uh, we are here computing uh, the energy for the current transaction. Um, so if there's a length field, so run the bit being passed, we're having a, maybe a complete Ethernet packet or, or whatever it is, maybe a 32-bit, 32 32-byte 32 cache line. We'll take the length of that, multiply it by five uh, picojoules, and then we will um, call update energy, um, and we'll basically add that on in much the same way as we added on the time to the, to the timing variable. Um, and so this enables each transaction to compute its energy, local energy use uh, and add it onto the local account for that component. Um, now this is actually bad coding style because we end up doing floating point multiplies here for every um, uh, transaction debit, which is a bad thing to do. So instead what you actually do is compute these in the constructor. And then there's also a PVT change callback when the voltage or temperature of change where you can recompute them and you'll add on the pre-computer values to get a floating point back. But I think it's ultimately not a floating point add, it's a 64-bit add at the bottom level, so it's reasonably fast. Which is what that slide shows. Um, now in order to get wiring at distances, we need to um, have some idea of physical layout. Now a physical layout typically involves place and route, and that gives us accurate wiring lengths. But can we do better than that with high level modeling? And the answer is certainly yes. Um, so first of all, we're going to exploit the um, uh, spatial, the, the design hierarchy, that intrinsic topology that it has, module hierarchy. Um, and so for each, um, uh, each, each system C module, we're going to assign it a chip region designation, and that's primarily so that we can have stuff on the circuit board or on chip A or on chip B and have different um, energy models for those different types of technology. But within a given region, um, what we're going to do, um, the area is going to be uh, the sum of the um, the components instantiated below, which are on the same chip. Because in fact, as you know in modeling, you sometimes put your DRAM inside your DRAM controller, which would be wrong in area terms, which is where this comes in. But, so we don't have to have the hierarchy exactly reflecting the physical layout. Um, but to a broad extent, the children which are on the same chip region within this component, plus a local excess, so for a, um, a RAM controller, we've got the area of the RAM cells, plus, or cache, we've got the area of the RAMs that make up the cache, plus the um, cache control logic, which is the local excess area. So all of the components are now going to be annotated with this sort of comp additional um, uh, computation, which is again just readily, quickly computed by rules of thumb. And then we can do interwiring estimates, not using a layout, which will be time consuming, but using Rents rule. Now Rents rule is a very simple rule of thumb that's originated in IBM 50 years ago. And it basically says that for all sorts of digital electronic systems, let's say in two dimensions, um, with module hierarchy, um, you will get a particular ratio of contacts and wires and wiring length. And if you do random layout, you get one ratio. If you do a good place and route, you get the following ratio. And that's all you need to know. We don't need to do the place and route, we just need to know the expected ratio that we would get from a good place and route. Um, and so what we actually do is um, we find the lowest common parent in the design hierarchy, so that the library will automatically find this. So it goes up between the two design hierarchies um, to, to the source and destination of a transaction connection. 
finds the lowest common parent, it then takes the area of that, then takes the square root of that, and it then takes the rent um, uh, multiplier of that, which is typically about 0.25 or something like that. So on average, your wire is going to be a quarter of the length of the side of your lowest common parent. That gives us a wire length really cheaply. So now, uh, we need to know how often those wires toggle um, and the uh, energy per toggle. Of course, we can also put in a real place and do placement if you wanted to, but we haven't done that for years. Um, so now we need to know um, which um, bits are actually likely to change. And in, um, I haven't got time to go into all the details of the generic payload, but in the TLM2 um, library, um, you don't, uh, you tend as far as possible to use this thing called the generic payload, which has various fields in it, such as address and data fields. Now, obviously, the data field is not going to be active uh, on the outward direction of a right, but it will be on the return direction of a right. And we need to know which fields are actually active in the payload for the different directions and different parts of the transaction. So we have an annotation system for that. And then we have uh, a technique for um, uh, computing the average number of toggling bits on the, in the active fields in the generic payload. Um, and doing that quite a lot at the start, but then moving over to a system where we only do it from time to time to see whether we've actually deviated from the average that we do at the start. You can see that the um, bit toggling handling distance computation is CPU expensive in the simulation. So that's, that's the power modeling library. And we can get various outputs, um, which I uh, won't go into too much detail. Um, this is a sort of VCD style output showing power spike um, consumptions from the particular simulation. Uh, we've also got ASCII art, I'll show you next, and we can output to a spreadsheet in the silk or CSV form. So this is the um, sort of output file that we get um, in the textual form. We get the total simulation duration, uh, and then we have uh, horizontal lines and for each uh, line, we have the, all the accounts. Uh, the accounts are given names, such as static energy, dynamic energy, wiring energy. And then there's another table at the bottom here, which is the power consumption, which is just these figures divided by um, time, the simulation time to get the average power. Um, and then the individual lines, uh, here we can see we've got some quite detailed ones about the different cache and tag realms in various CPU cores. But um, uh, you, the system is reasonably flexible in that you can automatically trace everything below a certain point and have them listed as separate lines in the report file or add it up to give you a subtotal for that, and that sort of thing. So now, turning to open risk, how did we get that uh, into the system? Well, we, we had two routes, which we reduced both of them. Um, so, open risk was available in RTL form, and we used Verilator to produce um, the System C model for it. Um, and then that was a net level System C model, like the very first System C I showed you. Um, uh, so, internally, it doesn't use System C very much, but the, the external components were those SC in, SC out, and all the individual wires. Um, and so, we wrote something called a transacting wrapper, which just takes those. Uh, wiggling wires and turns them back into subroutine calls so that uh, we can interact with the rest of the system in a high level form. Uh, and the second approach that we did was we took the file called Simdos, capital C, which I believe is partly multi generated um, from the awesome simulator, which is a fairly lean instruction set simulator. And again, um, we uh, manually wrote a system C TLM wrap around that. Um, and it turns out that this one goes. Um, uh, quite a lot faster than that one, um, but by the time uh, you add on all the other parts of the system, all the detailed power annotations and so on, then um, the difference in performance is only about two to one, um, because this is a press and dog out in terms of its difference in performance. Um, and also for this one, we had to add various extensions. Uh, Jeremy has already added a backdoor for similar to exit and one for um, writing to a virtual UART, um, but we added some more to get atomic bus transactions, low and store condition and so on. Uh, and then how did we get power for this? Well, this is 
they are starting to get a bit uh, unfirm in their ground. Uh, Full of virulated, well, we haven't done it, but the approach that we can use is if you look at the code generated by virulator, it makes most of its assignments to variables using macros. And you can replace the definition of those macros with macros which actually can compute the handling <coughs> distance of the um, bits that have changed. And so you will get an activity ratio per variable out of the simulation. Um, and again, you might apply that technique by only computing it and measuring it in detail periodically um, and then using running averages. Um, for the simulator, um, we, um, again, both of them have to add static power consumption in the constructor, which is just a number we just made up using published numbers of cores in general. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we added an array indexed by current construction for its complexity, put them in four classes by hand, and then we just multiply that by some number of nanojoules per instruction, and that gives us something to log down. So it's uncalibrated, or it's highly parameterizable in that form. Um, so this is the, um, the sort of system that we mostly work with. Um, this shows a complete system uh, with uh, four open risk 1200 cores. Each one of these is either very relatable, fast ISS, and then uh, while we're in a Harvard approach, we have separate IND caches for each one. Each of these caches can be can operate various policies uh, and be different sets of the little one in a different structure that's all prioritizable. Um, but if it's a, let's say, an eight way set associated cache, then it will actually have 16 rounds inside it to tag and data. And each of those will be a system C component annotated with its own power and layout details, as I've explained. Uh, and the basic parameterization of that's come from using an online tool from HP called Capto, which um, you can take the, the, the um, basic parameters and work out the macroscopic metrics like area per bit. And so on. Uh, then we have um, uh, various bus models, and we have a UR model, which opens next term. Uh, when we, oops, it's the first out of the character. Uh, then we have a DRAM controller, and we have uh, from the University of Maryland, we have a simulator for DRAMs, uh, which is a very detailed DRAM simulator, it's parameterizable with various data sheets. And we'll put a TLM wrapper around that as well, so that we can get accurate power measurements out of the DRAM cycles. Um, if OL2 or L3 shown on that, we write our GCC and run it. A very quick demo, maybe. So, I mean, here it is. Something going here. It's computing um, a uh, SHA secure hash. It's taken five seconds to run um, 3360, that number. 369 kilo instructions, kilo instructions on one core to the bus cycles. And we'll also see the um, power ASCII art report type thing, not much being traced there. Um, you can see the average power used was 19 watts in that simulation room. Um, uh, we'll just give some time for some questions, don't we? So, um, uh, yes. yes. Um, so we've got our 15 minutes. Oh yeah, well th this shows the uh, effect of adjusting the loosely timed quanta, which as I said was um, how far a thread is enabled to run ahead of the system C code before it synchronizes with the rest of the system. And so here we have two cores running printf hello world, um, and with three different settings of this global quantum. And if we use the full GCC, libc stuff and so on, then it's very safe and the semaphores around the print station so that lines don't come out all interleaved. But here we see um, per character interleaving, then the process is running virtually in block step. Uh, here we see um, slightly uh, less interleaving. Um, and this one we see about all of one core running completely to completion. In the hundred, less than 100 microseconds before the quantum is expanding when the other core ran printed and it was so 
and we get a difference in uh, performance um, as a result of that. So that with everything turned on, we're running at about 50,000 instructions per second on a, a rather old Pentium. Well, I should run it on a that uh, one I was just demonstrating it was running on my old Pentium here, but I've got a much faster one next A and B thing on my desk as well that I've now. But anyway, this sort of baseline um, with everything turned on, and this shows the performance change as we adjust uh, the TLM uh, quantum. And what we basically see is that as we get an hour of greater freedom in the scheduling, uh, the execution time goes down a bit uh, and uh, we get better performance. But it's not a huge difference because the, um, uh, well it's a big difference for this bottom one here, um, so I'll tell you what, what all the two to one difference is, it's not very much difference up here. So what are these different experiments reported on here? Um, so th this green is the baseline model without cut annotation. And system C has something called DMI, which is a backdoor where you can access memories without actually doing bus transactions. So your bus loading traffic um, will be wrong in the results. And that gives you even faster simulation. Um, but here is what we get um, if we um, turn on our energy quantitation, energy login, huge performance hit. Uh, and then if we turn on the, um, the hop count login, um, so that we know the utility of each hop to a multi-hop um, bus structure uh, goes down to that. And finally, if we turn on this bit level transition counting constantly, we get this uh, really severe. So this brings us down to 50,000 instructions per second rate um, for one core. And if we run six cores, then we get six times slower than that because system C underneath the single threaded. So, but this, this automatically backs off back to this after a reasonable amount of computing time because it thinks running averages it's got a good enough limit of periodically samples. And most recently, we have been uh, measuring the actual power consumption of uh, not an open risk but a six core uh, AMD system, uh, which has, um, we have detailed system C models of the SRI um, system request interface, the hype channel, its crossbar switches, two instances of the DRAM banks on the motherboard and so on, uh, and um, uh, trying to uh, correlate the measurements. So we've got the x86 ISS now, and we're trying to correlate the high profile figures that we get for all the cache messages and that sort of thing against the actual measured power consumption. So here's um, a big resistor that's put in series with a 12 volt supply that feeds um, just the processor and we can measure um, the current. Uh, so this shows on, a, on my old two core machine running um, two versions of the splash benchmark on a single core, um, no, on two cores, and then running it on one core where it took longer and used less power while it's running. And then on top of this is quite a lot of noise, which is because it was running multi-user mode and also so email was going through that, but also power probes also on the same machine. And if we run single user mode and so on uh, on a dedicated setup, um, then we get rid of the noise and get lovely, consistent, repeatable results. So this is our six core AMD phenom system being power probed. And nice clean results for um, running various things. And what we've actually discovered from measuring the power consumption is that um, the um, old adage that I lecture to the undergraduates um, is that it's better, this is, the old adage is wrong, it, you know, the old adage is it's better to run at the lowest clock frequency you can for as long as possible because that will give you the most energy efficient computation. Uh, but it turns out on this particular um, motherboard, um, there seems to be a lot of clock gating going on with the um, main DRAM controllers and with the L2 cache in particular. And once that clock gating has come out of sleep mode, it's running, it's using a lot of power, and it can serve uh, actual cores uh, with useful traffic uh, for very little further incremental traffic. And so um, that's if we look at some of the details of these 
which I haven't got time to go into, it's running from three to six cores on a non uniform architecture. We get one, two, three, and then it drops down a bit, one, two, three, and we've got six cores in use. And uh, more than that, it starts to take longer in the time domain of the um, use of more power and so on. So it kind of all makes sense, but there's a lot more to be done to calibrate it all. Uh, and I've got some numbers here which uh, I intend to replace with more accurate numbers pretty soon. You know, so I won't, won't present them right now, if that's okay. I will give them parts. But basically, we haven't got good, uh, good numbers so far yet, despite all the work. So what does it look like in terms of it? So you showed the increase in computational cost for turning on different bits of the, the modeling, right? Well, no, no, this is measurement of the real computer. Sorry, I shouldn't have explained this. is measurement of the real computer um, running the same program on more and more cores. Uh, and what we've done here is, uh, so the previous one, so I shouldn't have explained more clearly. This one, we sorted the same amount of data um, here, here, and here. These two runs we did on um, two cores. This one we did on a single core. So it, um, if we compare the area, we might expect them to be the same, but they're not. Um, and uh, this one obviously took twice as long as we used the cores. So no, I mean, the, the system C model, when you ramp yeah. up the complexity, how much better do the numbers get? The, the, the system C model just degrades reciprocally because uh, it's single threaded, it's using one processor called the some serious faults with system C which stop it being um, genuinely multi threaded. You need, I think it even needs to be a new name from the genuinely concurrent system C, system C plus or something. Sure, sure. But I mean, like the actual results you get out of it, I mean, I presume they get more accurate in terms of when you ramp up, you know, when you actually count the number of bit transitions. How much more accurate and how much of an improvement in the results do you see? Um, I can't say anything about the accuracy of the results, really. Um, we get a lot of agreement to the 20 30% sort of um, value uh, between what we expect and what we predict. So we measure some things, produce some coefficients by regression, stick them into a holdout experiment, look at the accuracy of the answer, and um, it's, um, it's of that sort of order, that's all I can say today. Okay. And the, so, so what sort of open risk system were you actually doing actual measurements on? Oh, well that, again, I was actually doing the actual measurements on an x86, so, so we don't expect a great deal of correlation between simulation um, uh, of the risk and running on x86, although it's the same C program compiled with the same level of optimization in the same uh, sort of memory architecture. So it would be quite good to get some measurements from actual open risk. It would be, but that's why we've also now got a detailed x86 model of the hardware board, so you know, there's two ways we can go with what we're doing. <laughs> These results are very inconsistent are set up. We've got to change one half of it to be the same as the other half. Two ways of doing that. Um, uh, you didn't mention modeling clock power. Um, and of course, on a kind of modern AC, clock power is a very large component of system power. That's right. So um, how, how did you address that? I, I think we haven't addressed it so far. And it is one of the biggest um, uh, sources of inaccuracy. Uh, a, the, as I was saying about this um, uh, phenom result, uh, this one here, um, you know, the reason that this jumps from here down to there um, is to do the clock gating, and that's not in our system, it's not being modeled. Um, so, um, what we, we've got some simple models of it. Um, so, when you're doing a spin lock on a, uh, a mutex acquire, um, you can execute special instruction. I've overloaded one of the no-ops on open risk so that it's a core pause. Um, Intel has actually got a pause instruction. And what that's designed to do is basically make that core non-aggressive in terms of its use of on-chip resources for some time. Unspecified quite how long, but at least a couple of pipeline depth full of time. And uh, so this gives you a reasonable chance of um, uh, with saves power when you're spin locking um, and, and also optimizes the performance of other on chip resources 
optimizes the availability of other object resources for threads, which are usefully doing work at that time, such as sharing and using to in course. Um, and um, so we have put that in the model, in that um, we can alter the static power for you know, 10, um, well, half a microsecond or whatever it is, um, while we're um, spin locking. Uh, and of course, uh, we don't have any dynamic power from that core while it's in, in, yeah. in that mode. So, that so you can kind of overload the static power system with some notion of clock power. You certainly can, yeah. but the, the systematic approach to doing that, uh, we don't have. Um, and you briefly mentioned DVFS, but ha you didn't really talk about how that's instrumented in there. Um, the, yes, you can, at any point you can set the voltage for your current chip region with a callback to the kernel, and all of the components in that region will have their PVT method called, and they can recompute uh, their energy quanta and adjust their, their static power. Uh, and so the static power will then be different from then on, and also the... Multiplier for the wire power. Yeah. I think 20% target is extremely aggressive, right? If, even if you look at RTL level power estimation, yeah. um, people haven't really been able to achieve that. That's right. So uh, get, get, I don't think it, it seems to be um, easy to get numbers that are 20 or 30 percent accurate in the um, experiments done so far. Um, and so what this is really telling us, if anything, is that a high level model is just as good as a low level model. Uh, it's probably a false statement, but that's what it appears to be telling us. Yeah, we, and we I think there's also a, there's a big difference between characterizing one system getting it to do something else and seeing if the correlation is good, That's or right. coming up with a system that can predict the behavior yeah, yeah. of a new... Exactly, so I've got two AMD motherboards which differ in their um, uh, L3 cache, and so doing comparison between those is one thing. Yeah. Do. And then also being able to reliably predict things like what happens if you turn off the L3 cache, uh, and find out how accurate you were. Um, it's the sort of experiment that we need to do. And do you see in industry there's, um, you know, uh, carbon, the the system uh, level simulation tool that, um, that the, the people are using the model SOCs, they support some power estimation. Have you looked at that? No, I haven't looked at what they do. I'm very familiar with carbon. <laughs> Jeremy and I ran a company that was their main competitor. Yeah, but they've, they've recently, well, they reckon they've got half decent power simulation. Right. Mm. Good. That's all. So we have to go and talk to them now when they're on the computer. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, well thank you very much, David.